Okay, good morning everyone. Hopefully you can all hear me. I'm Vicar Petzold from Holy Cross Moline, filling in today as Pastor Golter is away with, uh, he's been exposed to COVID, has tested negative, and uh, so hopefully he's feeling well and be back soon. Um, Today, you should have received two sheets. We have a study guide and a hymn. So those two things, if you don't have one, they're over here on the on the Prairie Farms uh, cooler here. All right, so today's study is going to be on the creed, and it's going to be approached from the viewpoint of a hymn study on the hymn, Lord, Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word. Uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this great hymn, and uh, so as we look at this hymn today, we will be uh, seeing how it relates to the creed. Let's open with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously revealed yourself to us in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet one true God. Grant that through our study of the creed that has been drawn from your word, our hearts may burn within us as our faith is strengthened to understand your blessings to us that come through your creation, redemption, and sanctification. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, um, just a note on the psalm, Psalm 119, 5 through 10. All of the hymns, you probably know this, I'm sure Jacqueline has probably taught you many, many things and could probably teach a hymn study on, on a hymn better than I. But, uh, <laughs> but anyways... In the bottom right corner of every hymn that you have in your hymnal, not in this one, it got, it got cut off a little bit down there, but there's a selection of scripture readings that, um, that are used in the development of the hymn. And one of those for this hymn is Psalm 119, specifically verses 5 through 10. So I'd like to read those responsively now to start our study. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. So as we get into the the hymn a little more, you'll see how a lot of those themes in that psalm will, will come to bear. So introduction to today's study. To be steadfast means to be firm, fixed, settled, or established. It also means not changing, fickle, or wavering. It means to be constant. By remaining constant and steadfast in God's word, God comes to us and strengthens and sustains us through all trials and tribulations of this life and provides for all our needs of body and soul. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. So the hymn of the day, of course, is Lord, Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word. Uh, from the Lutheran Service Book, number 655, written by Martin Luther in 1543. So this one, has, this hymn itself has remained steadfast uh, over time. So now here's a, a quote from uh, a book that was put together called The Hymns of Martin Luther, and this is a, a little commentary on this hymn. The threat of Turkish invasion, along with complicity of the papacy, informed the original lines of the first stanza, restrain the murderous Pope and Turk. When the threat had subsided, the words were altered to be applicable to all threats. And then the tune bears strong resemblance to Savior of the nations come and grant peace we pray in mercy, Lord. So just an interesting insight to you know, how the, the texts are changed over time depending on the, the particular application. But anyways, just just a neat little insight that um, if you're ever singing it and you are threatened by the Pope or a Turk, you can change it back. 
and <laughs> and uh, that'd be fine. So, okay. Now the scripture readings, as mentioned, there are four of them for this hymn uh, noted in the hymn. So, uh, if you have a Bible, turn to Second John chapter uh, Second John. If not, I'm going to read it, so that's fine too. So Second John verse nine. Okay. We've already read the Psalm, Psalm one nineteen, five through ten. Now Second John verse nine says um, I'm using the ESV Bible, so uh, you might have a different translation. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So I guess we should probably have sung the hymn already, so that way when we read these, we kind of have an idea of where we're going. So why don't we do that together if you have your sheet. Let's just sing this hymn together, all three stanzas, and that'll help us to, to understand what we're getting at here. Okay. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your Son and bring to naught all he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your holy church that we may sing your praise eternally. O comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. This is a great hymn also to, to commit to memory. And you can sing this one every day if you want. You can sing it when you're sitting at a stoplight. You can, it's so brief but packed so full that you can sing it all the time and it'll be a blessing to you. Okay, so now... Having heard that and having read Second John 9, we'll turn to John 8, 31. Which says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And going on, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is part of the text for Reformation Day. Um, it goes through this whole section, and so, um, but, but for the the purposes of, of this hymn, just verse thirty one there. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So, if you ever are wondering if you are a disciple. <laughs> Of course, we look to our baptism, and that tells you for sure. But if you abide in his word, you are truly my disciples. So there's great comfort there. And then Ephesians chapter 4. I think abiding was in the, uh, the second John passage, too. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6, which says, well, I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to do 1 through 6. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay. So those are some pretty sturdy passages that went into this uh, this hymn. So, okay, so now questions for discussion. And along the way, if you have any helpful insights or any questions or anything like that, feel free to ask. And we can talk about these things. Okay? All right. So let's sing stanza one together again. This will help you memorize it if you <laughs> haven't already. Okay. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your son and bring to naught all he has done. Sounds great, by the way. Nice job. So, although the creed is a statement of faith, we also recognize the necessity of the law. What word from stanza one describes the first function of the law? That sounds like a Bible trivia question, but <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Curb. That's right. Curb. The curb. Yep. And the curb is for, for all. The first function of the law, or first use of the law, um, is to curb sin, to, to give us protection, especially in our bodies, but also for our souls. Okay, now we're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Okay, so who, because we have in our first stanza here, um, who is the prince of this world in that reading? Satan. Mm -hmm. Yep. Curb those who buy deceit or sword, because in the reading we had um, children of wrath, like the rest of all mankind. Curb those who by deceit or sword, so by lying or physical violence, would wrest the kingdom from your son. So to rest means to, W-R-E-S-T, not to take a nap, but to rest means to pull away violently with a twisting motion by force. There's a pretty vivid description there of what it means to rest. It's more than just, you know, I guess if, you, if you're a wrestling fan or anything like there's a lot of violence and twisting motions in order to try to get away or to try to pin someone down. Uh, it can also mean to distort, pervert, or change the true meaning. Do we see any resting going on in our world today? <laughs> yeah. I identity. You know, is a is a big, big thing. Um, you know, you can just things that are, are so plain and clear can be clouded by the devil, by the world and our own sinful flesh. This resting is is more than it can be more than just to pull away violently. Yeah, distort, pervert, or change the true meaning. What are some of the ways in which Satan attempts to wrest the kingdom from Jesus? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, any of those. Um, I was thinking about the parable of the sower, you know, and, and all those, when you, when you said that, all the distractions, all the things that just draw your attention away from Jesus. It doesn't have to be, you know, a big, a big thing. He does it in s- very subtle ways. Um, I mean, we, we talked before, who's the prince of this world? When you think of a prince, you don't think of some goblin that's hideous. And, you, you know, a prince is someone that's usually like Prince Charming, you know, or, or any of, you know, royalty, clean, rich, successful, whatever. Um, they're attractive, and that's part of the devil's trap, is that he attracts you to things that God has not given to you, um, which is coveting, which is idolatry. So all of this goes, so, um, so the law is a curb against those things. So, so we can think of a million ways that Satan attempts to wrest the kingdom from Jesus. So why is it important then for God to keep us steadfast in his word? So we can tell the difference. So we can know right from wrong. Yeah. Because to the world, you know, it's just... Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're in a state of confusion, and all you have to measure... If, if you want to measure what's straight and all you have is something crooked to measure it against, how are you going to know if that thing is straight? You won't. So you have to have God's word um, so we know the truth. And the truth will set us free <coughs> from that. Okay. All right. Luther's explanation to the first article of the Creed Oh, on the back, eventually, if we get there, it's going to say for suggested activities based on today's lesson for further study, um, read about the Apostles' Creed on pages 128 to 230. There's quite an extensive treatment in the catechism. Those page numbers correspond to this catechism. So if you have any of the other dozen catechisms, (laughs) find the section in the explanation on the Creed and that's basically what I'm, I guess I shouldn't have necessarily. Originally, this is part of a bigger study, a 10-lesson study on the catechetical hymns of Martin Luther. And so um, there are nine more lessons. If you're interested, I can, it was a project I did for the seminary. So this is just one piece of a bigger thing, and all of that was keyed into the Lutheran service book and this, the 2017 catechism. Anyways, It also has the catechism in here, which is good. All right. So the first article of the creed, which we all have memorized, but so I don't stumble here. First article of the creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. So with that in mind, how does this stanza relate to God as creator? Mm -hmm. Yep. Especially... um, especially the line, and still takes care of them. Oh, go ahead.
Mm -hmm. It belongs to God. It is His kingdom. Yep. That's right. Even when it looks like like the devil's winning, he's not. He can't take the kingdom from God. It doesn't belong to him. And he can't bring to naught all he has done. All right. Very good. Okay. Any, any thoughts on the first stanza? <coughs> Keep us steadfast in your word. We hear that all the time. Listen to the word. Stay in the word. A little bit all the time. You know, Deuteronomy 6 talks about you know, keep it in front of you all the time. When you wake up, when you go to sleep, when you walk around along the way, when you sit in Bible study together, you know, when you're at a, a stoplight, when you're anytime, all the time. Okay. And it's a gift. That's the thing, too. It, it can be easily confused that, you know, well, I have to read my Bible. No, it's a treasure. It's a gift. It's God speaking to you. Um, this is how he has, has chosen to reveal himself to you. And so it's good. So receive that gift with joy. All right, let's move on then to stanza two. So we're moving on from the first person of the Trinity, the Father, now into the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son. So let's sing stanza two together. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your holy church that we may sing your praise eternally. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known. So how is the power of Jesus Christ made known to the world? Through the church. That's right. Through the preaching and the teaching, the administration of the sacraments, rightly. Yep, through the believers, the disciples. thinking of the, the power it just made me think of Romans 1 for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek that would be a great epiphany text right here but we get Ephesians 3 so that's fine for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. So you who believe speak the word to someone who doesn't, and then they believe from faith for faith. That's how it's passed on, generation to generation. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This is kind of what we were talking about before. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Okay, so you even see that the power of Jesus Christ made known to the world in very creation. No one is without excuse, according to this. Okay. So the power of Jesus Christ is made known to the world. And on, on the back side of the page, do we see persecution happening to Christians in our world today? <laughs> of course we do. It's in, in, and before we, we describe what ways, it's important to have a good understanding of what persecution is. You know, sometimes we, we jump right to martyrdom as, the, as persecution. The, and it is the ultimate, um, that is kind of the, the highest form when someone is killed for their faith in Jesus. That is certainly persecution. 
But even Christians, um, in general, if you are harassed in any way for your faith in Jesus, that's persecution. If you are um, excluded from anything because of your faith in Jesus, that's persecution. So if there is any kind of division, if there's any kind of um, outcasting of believers for any reason, that is persecution. So, um, so obviously we see persecution happening to Christians in our world today. In what ways? So there's a cost there. So in, yeah, so if, if your sports team is playing on Sunday morning, there's a decision that has to be made. Do you either go to church or do you go play sports? And so, yeah, and, and I think that where the persecution would come down in that is if they intentionally make sure that they do it on Sunday morning. Because <laughs> what's the excuse? Well, I can't go to church because it's, it's too early and Sunday's my day to sleep in. But there used to be, um, back in Michigan, there was a, a, right by our pastor's house was this huge soccer um, complex. I don't know how many fields they had. It was just a massive, you could barely see the end of it. And Sunday morning, that place was packed. And I always thought, what a great mission field there. <laughs> you know, just roll in and, and start talking to them. You know, and that's, so that's, that's kind of the answer to those things. Um, of course, I would rather you be here hearing the word, but then, you know, afterwards, if you're so inclined, go ask, hey, you know, I've got something even better than soccer. You know, <laughs> eternal life, forgiveness of sins, you know, all these things you may have never considered before. You know, maybe the curb hasn't, hasn't worked. Maybe the mirror hasn't, uh, hasn't been shown to you properly yet. Any other ways that, that we're seeing? Yep. Mm hmm Yeah. The idea that there can be total separation. You know, and I had this thought recently. Jesus is involved in every aspect of your life. We believe that. We believe that Jesus is present always, everywhere, with us, by his grace. So then how can you separate, think you can separate him out of where you spend most of your days, either at work or at school or wherever? It's just, it's, uh, it's phony is what it is. You know, it, it is a, a perversion because we know that Jesus is with us. We read in the text that he abides with us. He's always with us. And so to, to go to a place like that, where they tell you, no, Jesus can't be here, you know, or you can't, you can't pray to him because we've got more important things to teach you, like some kind of newfangled math or, <laughs> or you know, critical race theory or something like that. Mm -hmm. There are ways that you can do it kind of quietly, though. For example, I taught at West High School. Okay. And you can post on the outside of your door that the Bible study group is meeting every Monday at the time. So there are ways that you can get around and still talk about Jesus in the school or publicize it somewhere. Yeah. 
So it's going to be more of an informal approach, but you could still do it. Yeah, that's good. I think about some, um, we know some missionaries in Turkey, and they go there and they say, well, we came here to teach you how to I teach you English, you know. So we're going to teach you how to, that's how they get there. That's when they go through customs or whatever, they say, we're here to teach people English, and that's, that's what we're going to do. And they do do that. And then afterwards, they teach them about Jesus in English <laughs> or whatever language they need. Yeah. Interesting how it, how it all gets sliced and diced when we add all these extra, you know, pile on all of these extra rules to try to look how hard they have to have to work to try to keep, you know, Christianity out of it. So, yeah, very good. I can tell this is something that's near and dear to your hearts. This is important. Um, yeah. So. So. The word of the Lord endures forever, and you can't, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we'll just keep looking for opportunities. Um, we'll pray for our, our teachers and uh, those in the workforce that are being persecuted. And it's important, too, to, to recognize when you're being persecuted. When you, when anytime you're assaulted by the devil, it's important to recognize that and then pray that God would give you wisdom and guidance in that situation. Yeah, so it's wonderful when you're able to recognize those things. And remember, Luther always taught, you know, what makes a theologian, and the, the, the Latin terms were, were ratio, meditatio, tentatio, which in our terms are pray, meditate, and be afflicted, or tempted. Um, so that way, the way this works, and every day, all your lives, you begin with prayer, you meditate, pray that God would open your your hearts and minds to receive his word, meditate on that word, and then wait for the affliction to come, because it will come. And then that drives you back to prayer again. And so this is the entire uh, life of a Christian. And so pray, meditate on God's word, and then don't be surprised by it. You know, God does not want you to be uninformed of the, the things to come why he gives us his word and that's why we ask that he keep us steadfast in his word so how can Christians take comfort even in times of suffering pray pray yep repeat the words back to God that he has given you to pray pray the Lord's prayer there's there's what's that 
Sing hymns, yeah. Sing hymns. Pray, praise, and give thanks. Thank God for the suffering um, because that suffering reminds you that you need him. Uh, and it, it's important, too, with thinking about the creed. So in the, in the catechism, we have the Ten Commandments, the creed, and the Lord's Prayer, the three chief doctrines. The um, Ten Commandments, there's, there's no, no law or nothing to do that falls outside of those Ten Commandments. So any, any other thing. And then same with the Lord's Prayer. There's nothing you can pray that's not already included in the Lord's Prayer. It's complete. And also the creed that we have. There's nothing that you can believe about God that's not already included in the creed. And I like to think of it that way. So if you can't think of what to pray, pray the Lord's Prayer. It's all in there somewhere. And it'll, it'll come to you. you. You know what you're asking for. God knows what you're asking for even before you ask it. So the Lord's Prayer is another good one that you can pray. I forget, it's 20 seconds, something like that. So when you get done singing <laughs> this hymn at a stoplight, you still might have time to, to sneak the Lord's Prayer in there. But it's, it's good to just have these habits. of um, It's gotten me through a lot of road rage <laughs> in my day. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I wouldn't include that necessarily in suffering, but uh, but it is a temptation. <laughs> so, but we rejoice in in God's word. Okay, second article of the creed. Just have a little. That's why there's so much emphasis on the the catechism here too, is because this was intended for a catechism approach. All right, so second article of the creed what does this mean i believe that jesus christ true god begotten of the father from eternity and also true man born of the virgin mary is my lord who has redeemed me a lost and condemned person purchased and won me from all sins from death and from the power of the devil not with gold or silver but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death that i may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. So what does it mean to be redeemed? To be bought back. Yep, you think of, you know, you redeem a coupon or something like that. Um, in economic terms, he bought back. So how did Jesus redeem us? Yep. The sacrifice on the cross. Yep. Not with gold or silver. So that, that helps go, you know, to buy back. There's more to it than just, you know, here's ten bucks I want. I want him back. Nope. It was his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. So knowing that Jesus died to pay the price for our sins, does it change the way that you think about sinning, even in small ways? If you consider the price that was paid for you, there's two ways of looking at it. What incredible value you have to our Lord that's the, the comforting way to look at it, that Jesus was willing to do that for you. That's incredible. That's the gospel. That's what brings people to saving faith. But then, rejoicing in that, um,
apologize for the for breaking your <laughs> your uh, gadget here. I just recently turned 41, and you know those those old timer jokes are starting to hit a little bit closer to home now. All right, I'm getting it. I'll, I want to leave it in the the same condition I found it, but that's <laughs> all right. Thank you for that. So. I don't know, could you hear me at all? Do I have to go back 10 minutes or how long is this? <laughs> 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, well it's gracious of you to, <laughs> to not just let it be silent for the rest of the time. <laughs> all right, comfort. So, so far we've heard comfort many, many times in this passage. All right, so if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. That's quite stunning there. Count the number of times the word comfort appears. There's, there's a lot of them in there, a dozen or so. In what ways does God comfort you? This verse 6 here, if we are afflicted, we were just talking about prayer, meditation, and affliction. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Does that make any sense to you? You can see why unbelievers have a real issue with Christians believing things like this. This would appear to be ridiculous. The whole goal in our society, it seems, is to remove all suffering, to just make everything as comfortable as possible. You know, to just kind of, yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. The comfort comes from the Word of God. And if you're a little too comfortable, then, then yeah, maybe you, you don't think you need it. You're doing just fine on your own. Yeah. So if you're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. We don't often associate suffering and comfort together like that. But that's it's because true comfort is not in, in how we feel for the day. You know, like if, if, you have, if you have headaches all day long and then all you want is that headache to go away, you know, you can, you can still be comforted by God's word even with a headache. That's a great example. Yeah, the, the child, just happy and content playing, and then all of a sudden, times get tough, <laughs> scrape their knee or something, and they take off running to mom or dad. Yep, yeah. And that's, we're God's children. We do the same thing. Something happens to us, we get worried, we get anxious. Oh, what do I do? We turn to the Lord. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, Christians are well equipped to handle even the worst challenges in life. That's right. Because the Lord keeps us steadfast in his word. 
how are peace and unity different from strife? We have send peace and unity on earth, support us in our final strife, lead us out of death to life. So peace and unity, how are they different from strife? Think of the term reconciliation. You know, how can you be if if you're not at peace, then you're in the midst of strife. If you're not united, then there's something there's something there's some element of strife there. And so the way this happens then for Christians is through forgiveness. That bridges the gap there between that that eliminates the strife and returns you to peace and unity. How does the Holy Spirit lead us out of death to life? That's a great e- epiphany stanza here too. Lead us out of death to life by the Holy Spirit. Think of how the, the wise men were led by the star. The Holy Spirit brings you to faith. And that's how the Holy Spirit leads us out of death to life. He leads us to Jesus in his word. Okay. We're going to go then to the third article of the Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified, and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, He daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. So where do you go to find peace and unity on earth? That's right. Prayer, church. Mm Mm-hmm the word yep it all goes together the spirit and the word can't be separated Jesus and the word can't be separated the church and the word can't be separated the word is involved in all of it and that's where we find peace and unity on earth and then how do we receive the peace of God Mm mm-hmm through the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's so encouraging. Let me see here. Right here. Um, Speaking of, you know, we receive the peace of God through forgiveness, and it made me think of the the section on confession in the catechism of the office of the keys. It says that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Where is this written? This is what St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you have that peace. You receive the Holy Spirit in your baptism. So remember your baptism all the time. It's a big deal. All right. Any questions? Do you feel comforted? Better than feeling comforted, do you know you're comforted? Do you believe you're comforted? Not every day you're not going to feel this, this great comfort we talk about. But 
Our emotions are fickle. That's what we said at the beginning, I think. That's right. Let's, I want to look at the introduction one more time to see if we got to where we were going. To be steadfast means to be firm, fixed, settled, or established. It also means not changing, fickle, or wavering. It means to be constant. By remaining constant and steadfast in God's word, God comes to us and strengthens and sustains us through all trials and tribulations of this life and provides for all our needs of body and soul. We don't need to go anywhere else uh, to have our needs provided for. And God provides all that we need in his word. All right. Let's sing the, let's sing the whole hymn one more time. You, if you want to show off, do it from memory. <laughs> or just mouth the words quietly and I'll be impressed. <laughs> All right. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your son and bring to naught all he has done. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your holy church that we may sing your praise eternally. O comforter of priceless worth, Send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. Okay, so in conclusion, our one true God loves us, which is clearly shown through his loving acts of creation, redemption, and sanctification. This is most certainly true. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you have created us and provided for all our needs of body and soul. You have redeemed us through the precious blood of your only Son, Jesus, through his death and resurrection. And you remain with us each and every day by the Holy Spirit. Grant to us steadfastness in your word that we may be ever reminded of your love and mercy as we share that same love and mercy with our brothers and sisters in Christ and all our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hey, thank you, everyone.